let me begin the, the panel discussion, and this is a question that all of you or just some of you may want to answer. Let me begin by asking each panelist to introduce themselves and the organization they represent, and for our student panelist, for Courtney here, introduce maybe your shadowing experience uh, thus far. Okay, uh, I'll start. I'm Cindy White. I'm the executive director of the Charleston Area Chamber of Commerce, and Chambers of Commerce have been around for hundreds of years in the United States, and this particular one in this community has been around, oh, 90 years or so. All right, well, um, I'm Courtney Owen. Um, I'm a student in the entrepreneurship minor. Um, I'm also a student here in the School of Business. My major is accounting. Um, I'm, like Marco said, shadowing in the SCORE mentoring program here at Eastern. I've had one experience so far meeting with a client, and um, it was really interesting. Uh, he's developed his own product, and um, you know, it was interesting to meet someone. I've always been interested in the service side of entrepreneurship, so it's nice to meet someone who had a product idea and see where they were going to be going with that. I've been down here in this area for about 12 years. I came down um, from Lincolnshire, Illinois. I'm originally from Iowa. Uh, I was I started out as a swimming coach. I had a mentor that taught me how to be a good swimming coach. Uh, he had been an All-American, and I learned at that point the value of having a mentor, somebody that knew more about what you wanted to do than what you did. Um, I got a little tired of teaching uh, after a while, and I decided to start my own business. That worked out fairly well. I've since owned several businesses uh, in Illinois and either sold them or they didn't work, one of the two. And uh, I currently have a landscaping business. We'll be going into our 10th season uh, in Charleston next year. Uh, I became involved with SCORE about five years ago. I'm currently the chapter chair, and I'm also the assistant district director for the state of uh, Illinois. Um, SCORE is an organization that has been around since 1964. There are about 13,000 volunteers nationwide. We're in all 50 states. And we've helped about nine million, over 9 million people now start businesses successfully in this country. I uh, purchased a pro forma franchise about 14 years ago in Peoria, Illinois, and what pro forma does, we do all kinds of creative work, design work for magazines, catalogs, that type of thing, all types of commercial printing, those type of products, posters, we do the EIU sports schedule cards, um, we do promotional products, pretty much anything with your logo on it, you know, from a Frisbee to, you know, anything you can think of. Um, what I like about it, my strength is really in the area of sales, and I strongly think everybody should get a good sales background, whether you want to be in sales or not, the ability to deal with people is very, very important from the sales perspective. Um, but what I like about my job is every day is different, and I'm out and about, I'm in the office some, but I'm out doing different things and have a lot of flexibility to do whatever I want. But um, you know, my entire goal is just to keep increasing our sales and profitability of the company. Okay, very good, thank you. Now let me um, ask you, you guys have all been around businesses. You are a business owner, Jeff, in your case. Um, when you look back, when the other three, when you look around the businesses that you have interacted with, what are maybe the two top, two or, th two or three most critical resource deficiencies that you have observed that entrepreneurs may face or that they may have? Well, when I started, I started working out of my basement. And while it was a lot of fun to be sitting there in my sweats and my t-shirt, um, it's sometimes hard to get motivated to go out. And the other thing is, as you're trying to grow, the larger companies don't necessarily want to work with somebody working out of your basement. So what is the next step? Where do you get the resources to get an office? How do you get another employee? You, know, you don't really want an employee in your house. You have to go out and get office space. You have to keep growing and finding the resources both on the financial side as well as the employee side to help you grow your business, take advantage of the opportunities that might uh, might come along. I think avoiding debt is a, a real key. I also started my business from my home, um, and uh, I was taught, again, by a mentor uh, for my business experience as well. Uh, he was a very successful man. He had been a vice president for Motorola, and he'd start his own business, and uh, he taught me how to do the same thing. But one of the things he taught me to do was try not to outgrow your own finances. Uh, if you start getting to a point where you think you have to constantly borrow to make your money, uh, your business work, then you're, uh, 
potentially digging yourself a hole. You don't know uh, what your next year is going to be, but you will have that debt, whether you had business success or not, and you'll have to pay back that debt. So the idea is to make your business pay for your next step. And then as you want to grow again, make your business pay for that next step so you're not in debt to anyone but yourself. Mm -hmm. I think those are excellent points. And working with the Chamber of Commerce, uh, we work with our members, who are mostly businesses and not-for-profit organizations. And we currently have about 280 businesses and organizations that are a member of the Charleston Chamber. And our primary goal through the Chamber is to help sustain those businesses, the existing businesses, and help them grow. And we see examples of just what Jeff and Ted said every day. A lot of entrepreneurs have a great idea, but they don't necessarily come uh, just imbued with management and financial skills. So we see those two areas where they ultimately need the most help. Okay. So uh, all three of you guys have mentioned finance skills mm -hmm. as something that's critical um, and that may be missing. Um, I think with many entrepreneurs, as they're heading into this business idea, they may have a good idea, but the finance part may be, may be missing in some way. Um, we hear similar things from our students oftentimes. You know, we have our students in our classrooms, and oftentimes we hear, well, we have a good idea, and we, we're learning marketing and management skills, but for the finance part, we'll just hire an accountant. And so somebody who comes, comes to you with that, with that belief system, what would you tell them? Well, I think we would talk to them about definitely pull, as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, you pull together that team around you, one of which who could be your accountant. Maybe you've got a lawyer, you've got a mentor, whatever. But you darn well better have those financial skills and understand those business statements yourself um, so somebody doesn't um, cheat you out of some money or so you understand where that business is going and so you can grow it. And, and under, you have to understand the financials. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, though, that 60% of the small businesses started in this country since March of this year were started for $5,000 or less. You don't have to be a millionaire to become one. And while you may not have to know finance entirely, it's very, very important to have a good understanding of that because, as you had said, when people are there working with you or for you, if you're not paying attention to what's happening with the money, the money can be gone very, very quickly. Now, when we talk about finances, sources of funding are obviously a critical issue. Uh, what have you observed, and do you have any recommendations where people might turn that may not have the uncle with the, with the deep pocket, so to speak? I know man, many times on the franchise side, I mean, there, there's franchises you can get into for two or $3,000 up to McDonald's for who knows what that might cost. But I mean, starting out with a small franchise to try and, and learn and get your way going, a lot of times the franchises themselves will provide financing for you. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes your local banks and credit unions, it can be a tougher road to hoe depending on your credit. But if you're working on a franchise level, they want you to succeed because they get royalties from everything you sell. So if you have good credit and no debt, um, or as little debt as possible, they will really help you with the financing. I think one thing, a myth that needs to be dispelled is if you watch late night TV and you see the guy with the question marks on whatever and he's talking about <laughs> grants for to start a business. That is a misconception. There is no free money out there. Uh, there may be little bitty grants for minority or women owned businesses, but there's no pot of money out there to help you get a business started. You typically have to pull together uh, some money that the bank will lend you what percent of what you need maybe they want to see you put at least 30 percent right. of your own funds into your business you've got to have skin in the game for them to want to back you up so that's either got to be your own money or love money from family and friends so there's no but there's no free money out there <laughs> to start a business okay now we have four uh, panelists here that have very different backgrounds getting into this arena, whether it is running their own business or providing advice. Um, Jeff, you have chosen the franchise route. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about why, do you why did you choose the franchise route and what's the advantage that you see as opposed to doing something like Performa does by yourself? Well, part, part of owning your own business is just figuring out when and how to do it. 
Um, I worked for a commercial printer uh, for probably 12 years as their top sales rep. I decided to leave to go to another company, and uh, the grass was not greener, so six months later we agreed to disagree, so I was unemployed. So I would have probably never started my own company. I knew of Proforma, but if I wouldn't have been unemployed, I would never take the gamble to get away with my salary and my commission to start over. So a lot of people I know now um, who might do a job working, working for a bank, working for whatever it may be, if they get laid off or whatever it may be, that's the opportunity to really have already been looking and get involved in something, whether it be a franchise or not. I got involved with the franchise because Pro Forma was a client of where I used to work at, not my client, but I was familiar with them. So I decided I didn't want to work for anybody in the future. Here's a way to have the, some of the positives of a franchise, but yet it's still something where it's very sales based. It's not necessarily like a subway where you own a subway where it's the same sandwich every time. We can sell different niches. I sell to a lot of colleges. Some people sell to not-for-profits. Um, you can do almost anything with the franchise. We have 750 different offices, and they're all doing something similar but something totally different. So I like that. I like to be creative. I like to be sales focused. And I want to have fun every day. And that's a big part of why you're getting into your own business. If you're not having fun, you know, you're not accomplishing your goals. And by the same token, we all at least know from, from popular lore that franchising can be restricting. Right? Franchising provides you with a business format where, with, with, within which you have to operate. Any drawbacks? Well, I looked into several different franchises. I mean, one being kind of a maid service, one being like a morning coffee shop, although I don't like to get up early, so that wasn't a real, real good idea. <laughs> but um, but d different ones. I mean, I looked into like Midas mufflers and those types of places, but every one of those, you have to do it exactly the same way. And that didn't fit my personality. However, Pro Forma did, because even though it's got the structure of a franchise, it's mostly sales-based. It's not retail-based where people are coming into my shop, so I can really take it any which way I want and doing a lot of work in sports, which I really enjoy, doing work with colleges, doing work in other places, I can take those niches wherever I like. So whatever, whatever you may like to do, whatever your hobbies are, you can help work that way and make that a decent sized chunk of your business doing something you enjoy. Okay. To, to switch gears, business plans are something that we here in college obviously <laughs> preach to our students, something that we believe is important. Um, on the other hand, you hear stories out there about businesses that got started without a business plan or the business plan on a napkin. Um, what is your perspective on creating a business plan? Um, where would you recommend that people go to get advice about putting a business plan together? Well, when we have people stop at the chamber office who are talking about starting a business, I immediately refer them to TED and to SCORE uh, to help them get a business plan uh, going. Because if nothing else, if that just becomes the roadmap for where they go with the business, the process of going through the business plan is invaluable. It makes them think about all kinds of different questions and answer them and at least think about all the different things that go into a business. But, but sometimes Ted putting, helps them get it going. <laughs> sometimes putting together a business plan uh, can help the person realize that they're not ready to go into business. It makes it obvious to them uh, for the first time that they need a few other ducks in a row before they can actually get this thing off, a gr off the ground. Uh, generally speaking, you need a business plan uh, if you need financing, if you need to uh, approach a banker. Uh, when you go to the loan officer, he's going to want to take a look at exactly what you've uh, put together, what you've got in mind, how well you've put it together, whether you, you've put it together coherently uh, in a way that shows everything from basic grammar to uh, knowledge of the concept of your own business. Uh, you're trying to sell your idea and yourself to this banker. Uh, that's why I said you have to be willing to uh, put 30% or so in yourself because they're not going to say, well, yeah, well, I'll put in 100% of all your, all your needs, you know. It doesn't work that way. Um, business plans are really a growing, alive thing. As your business progresses, as it develops, your business plan should change. It should develop as well. Um, there was an interesting article in Entrepreneur Magazine, I think it was just last month, on uh, the one-page business plan. And it's talking, it's getting away from the 
40, 100 page business plan that frankly just makes your banker's eyes glaze over anyway. So you, you have to learn how to be succinct and you have to put the ideas together in a way that um, tells a story about uh, the business idea that you have. Uh, so we help people do that with SCORE. That's a very intimidating uh, Thing that they have they feel that they have to do well what I, when I'm trying to help somebody put together a business plan I'll give them an outline uh, we have several different kinds depending on what kind of a business you're trying to start is it a nonprofit uh, that's different than if it's a for-profit type of a business but we'll put together the business plan I have you do that first just I want to see if you're willing to do it if you're not willing to do that simple work for your own business maybe you're not ready to start your own business but then when we take that their initial work and then we start going through it and we modify it and uh, put it in a position uh, uh, so that it's actually presentable so that's one of the things that we do at SCORE. I think that was a great answer. All I can add to that is if you're not subscribing to Entrepreneur Magazine for $12, $14 a year, you need to. That's absolute must. There's so many ideas in there. As you're a sophomore, junior, senior student, as you're seeing different things, tear out a page here or there and figure out what ideas, what might interest you as you are getting near graduation. It's just an outstanding publication. Now we know Courtney has been working on a business plan for a couple of semesters now. A few. Yes. <laughs> How's that collection. going? How's that going? It's going well. Uh, I'm currently in Dr. Minnis's financial class, <laughs> entrepreneurial finance. It's wonderful. And I know you're all looking forward to getting to Dr. Minnis's class. Um, but uh, I, I love the entrepreneurship minor. I've learned a lot. Um, and like I said, my major is accounting, which is what will really hopefully help me with the financial side. That's partly almost why I chose accounting, was more to be an entrepreneur, so that I'd have those financial skills, because before that, I could say I didn't know anything about financial statements, and I know a lot more now. <laughs> is in a little bit of a difficult situation being on this panel tonight because first of all she's just new in this uh, shadow program um, to be a SCORE mentor you have to have a minimum of 10 years of business experience of your own or uh, be an executive for min minimum of 10 years from for some other business uh, there's some other requirements and you have to take a certain amount of training which she has been through um, she has not had the experience yet of owning her own business uh, we have been shadowing, she has been shadowing with me, helping a client who has invented something. One of the things that you under, must understand about SCORE is that we provide all of our services absolutely free. I don't get paid a dime. Nobody does in my organization. It's totally for free. It's the largest organization of its kind. There are many, many ways for you to go get business consulting help. There are people that get are paid consultants. You pay them for them giving you good advice. We do not get paid. We do not have a financial motive, therefore, in helping somebody. We don't have a bias to try and help ourselves in some way. So anyway, this particular client that Courtney is working with has an invention. One of the things that we uh, make sure of is that not only is there no charge, we do not talk about any Thing that is confidential to our client's business idea regarding an invention with intellectual property aspects of it obviously that's important uh, so we can't talk about what we're doing with them um, <laughs> but she's doing a great job <laughs> <laughs> she really is but uh, a lot of different types of clients can come to score as well um, like he said this client has already got a business idea and he's kind of taken a few of the first steps um, but other people come to score who you know, just have the idea in their head and haven't, haven't done any work yet. And then SCORE also gets clients that may already have a business started and are just having problems or struggling and need some help to figure out how to fix it. And having an unbiased group like SCORE, I think, is so important because they'll really tell you what they think about your ideas. A lot of times you're trying to start something, talking to your friends, your family. Um, while they're trying to be very helpful, a lot of times the advice is, is not real accurate, for lack of a better word. They're trying to help you, but they don't really know either. Just to mention this at this point, a little plug for our program. We are offering, we're going to offer this starting this, this coming summer, a new workshop for um, people in the community. So if anybody in the community is interested in signing up for a class, there's no entry, no access requirement for community members. 
uh, to learn how to put a business plan together. We're going to go through issues such as finance, cash flow, marketing. Um, we're going to be, uh, you, you, you will be taught by a panel of EIU faculty, of experts, and um, there will be a best business plan award. There will be a participation plaque that um, the business owner then could put on the wall of their, of their startup. Um, so if you are either working on starting a new venture, if you are in an existing venture and you actually have never put together a business plan and uh, a reason has come up so to, to do so, we invite you to consider this. We're planning on holding this um, between June 14th and July 27th, so at the peak of the summer, so to speak. Um, classes will take place every other weekend. We're looking at Friday evenings and Saturdays, and we're going to do it Friday evenings and Saturdays, then have a week off, then meet again and do this four times. And so the idea by the end of the, the, the workshop is that you would actually then have a business plan put together. So there's something for you to consider. Now let's switch gears again while our students are collecting questions from, from anybody here. Um, finding the right employees is a particular challenge in many rural communities, right? Often the needed skills may not be available locally. You may have something very exotic, something that may require special skills. Um, what is your advice? Or maybe you can provide an example about how to deal with this challenge. Have you encountered this before? Have you, Jeff, in your case, dealt with this yourself? You mentioned earlier employees as a critical resource. I, I, the first time I handle, or hire somebody in my office, I'm a sales guy. I've never really interviewed before. So I, she sat down across from me. I told her everything I wanted. She told me everything I just said. I'm like, this, this girl is good. <laughs> I hired her, and it was not a good match. <laughs> so I, I've learned that when it comes to interviewing, you know, make sure you're asking the open-ended questions and, and listening. But um, a lot of things comes down to, um, you know, except for people right out of school just graduating, I mean, your GPA, your involvement, your internships are huge when it comes to that. I like to see what people have done. Yes, you work, but did you work at the convenience store? Did you have an internship with the ABC company? Um, I always call your references. I don't always call the references you give me. I, a lot of times call somebody else I know at that same company to get the real answer. Um, so. That's a very important thing, and they, t they tell me not what you want them to say, I hear the truth, and that is a huge influence on whether you get hired or not, is what my friends say about you who know you. And so much of that involves what we might call the soft skills. Some of the technical and specific skills can be taught once you're on the job, but you can't always teach a person to have a good attitude, to be dependable, responsible. I mean, if you that's really what employers look for, those soft skills, some of those kinds of attitudes. I put an ad in the paper about four or five years ago. I, was, uh, I needed a couple more employees for my landscaping business. And <laughs> I really didn't expect or ask for a lot. I simply said, you must have a driver's license. <laughs> you must have your own transportation. I can't play taxi. And you must not have a criminal record uh, felony record because I'm going to be taking you to my clients homes and I need to know that I can leave and they'll be safe <laughs> pretty simple stuff I got 80 responses only two of them I met each and every one of them at the Lincoln Garden for a cup of coffee I had a lot of coffee that month <laughs> and only two of them out of the 80 81 actually two of them had a driver's license had wheels and no felony record, because I checked. I did background checks too. So it's hard to find good employees. I've got great employees right now. They've been with me now for some time. They come back every year, and I make sure they come back every year. <laughs> I pay much more to my employees than my competition does. I guarantee they come back. It's worth it to me. I don't have to worry about that. Which is a nice segue into a question that we've gotten from the audience. If you were starting a business, would it be better to start in a rural town such as Charleston? I, I think it really matters what type of business it may be. I mean, you, you have a way to get up and started for a smaller investment sometimes in a, in a more rural city, so it gives you a chance to go in there and, and work that for two to three years and maybe for 30 or 40 years, but it gives you a chance to kind of learn as you're going without as big of a, uh, of a debt load possibility. So I would, I would say it's a very good idea. It definitely depends on what the nature of the business is. 
Um, you have to look at the market you're in. If, you're, if you plan on selling a product or service within that market, you've got to be sure there's a match between that product or service and the market you're in. If you're going to be totally an internet-based, internet a global-type business, you can locate anywhere and do that. So it, it just really depends on the business. So. Okay. Have any of you seen this television show on Spike TV? It's on Sunday nights. It's called Bar Rescue. Anybody see it? Okay, a few of you have. How many of you have seen Shark Tank? Okay, a few have seen that. Bar Rescue. Um, There's also the, uh, what is it called, Restaurant Impossible? Yeah. Rest yeah. There's another oh, one. Restaurant Love that show. That's on the Food Network. <laughs> yeah, and uh, John Taffer is the guy that leads Bar Rescue. I've had an opportunity to meet him a couple of times, and he's a real advocate for SCORE. Um, he has... He has turned around over 800 failing businesses in the food, bar, entertainment industry. So he knows what he's doing. And he believes that if you are having a failing business, it's because you've got a failing business owner who is doing failing things. And the failing things that most failing business owners do is make excuses for themselves. And they'll look at themselves in the mirror, you know, and they're shaving every morning, and they're thinking about what a great job they're doing, and their business is going down the tubes because they won't admit the things that they need to face up to. Um, is it a good place, to, a good time and place, Charleston, to start a business? Um, there are businesses in this town that are very successful. There are competing businesses of those businesses in this town that are going down the tubes. Is it because the weather's better over on that side of town? Is it because the traffic's better on that side of town? No, those are excuses. So we have to really find out what the person is doing that is preventing him from getting ahead. I find it amazing in some of those shows where they're failing, so they hire these guys to come in and fix it, then they don't want to do anything they say. They won't listen. Right. Haven't they watched the show? That's why you called them, yet you won't listen. <laughs> You invite the consultant in, but you really don't want the advice. Yeah. The bottom line of business is really still about relationships. It's still business is still people to people. And if you're failing in those relationships or, or don't do well with people, they're probably going to have some problems in your business too. Now, since you mentioned relationships, dealing with people, one of our audience members is asking, would you prefer to go into business with family, friends, or just acquaintances? No. <laughs> <laughs> Want to elaborate on that? I have been in businesses where I've had a partner. I have been in a business or two where I've been involved with a family member. I have been involved in businesses where I was the sole entity. I like that last part the best. <laughs> Uh, as Jeff said, you know, sometimes a family member has great intentions, but just plain old bad advice. Um, if I were an airline pilot, my mother would say, I want you to go very low and slow. <laughs> Don't kill me, okay? You've got to do what is right for you and your business, and your brother, your uncle, probably doesn't know the answer to that question. That's why SCORE was developed, uh, to provide mentors for people. We have, if you want to start a business, I can introduce you to somebody in this country that's already started that business. And we can find out how they did it. And we can network with them, and they'll provide that information free. And be open-minded and just learn. You can learn so much if you'll just, you know, open your eyes and your ears. That's, that's so crucial to growing a business. Okay. No. One of our audience members is asking, would you, would you encourage starting a non-for-profit business as one of your first? Kind of depends on what your motives are. I'm helping a client right now who just changed her business into a non-profit business. Mm -hmm. uh, it's working out for her because of the type of business, which I can't describe. Um, <laughs> And that was the best thing for her. And this is her first business. When you get involved in aspects of nonprofit, you have to make sure you're dotting every single I and crossing all your T's because there are legal ramifications to uh, that type of business structure. And you've got to know what they are. And an attorney can help you with that, or we can help you with that. 
And not-for-profits used to be not quite as regulated or kind of could fly under the radar. Uh, that day has passed. They are restricted by just as many regulations as a for-profit business. So it all depends on, like Ted said, the motive for starting a not-for-profit. And I think in a not-for-profit, in many businesses, it's just very important to work at a not-for-profit for a couple of years and really learn what's going on and what you're trying to accomplish, what you're trying to help, and make sure that it is something for you, because going into something like a non-for-profit, totally cold, I think it'd be very difficult. Mm -hmm. Now, Ted, you mentioned the attorney, the help of an attorney. Obviously, depending on the type of business that you're starting, you know, incorporating a business, all of those things may require the help of an attorney. Now, attorneys we know are expensive. How do you get that assistance without necessarily having to incur the cost? Go ahead. I will have to say on that, going back a few years ago when I got divorced, I traded out my divorce attorney for a bunch of t-shirts and golf shirts, so that was a pretty good deal. <laughs> Kept the fees down. SCORE is not allowed to recommend a client to specific businesses. For example, I, you're my client and I know you need an attorney. My wife actually works at a law office. I cannot say what you need to do is go to such and such an attorney, can't do that. Now it looks like I'm being biased, I have a personal motivation, I can't do that. What I can, what I am allowed to do is I can give you three uh, attorneys' names in the area that I think would help you and I could include my wife's, uh, it's, it's not her off law office, but where she works, I could include that office. That would be legitimate. Same thing with a CPA or uh, anything else, I don't direct people to specific uh, professional help like that because it looks like th there's too much of a chance and opportunity uh, for personal motives to get involved. And if you own a small business or starting something, you'll have other friends and other acquaintances you meet that will have the attorney, that will have the CPA. Talk to them. See if they really like their person or don't like their person. There's nothing better than, uh, you know, finding through a referral. That's very important versus just grabbing somebody, you know, off the internet. I was just approached about a week ago by two young men who are starting or have started a business that offers an array of services to businesses. Everything from um, marketing, consulting, they'll work with you on your social media, uh, they're putting together, they've got a platform called uh, Coupon Genie, it's a, a marketing thing. But they also, one of their partners also has been involved with a, a business that for a set fixed fee per month you can get uh, legal advice for that fee. Uh, I thought that was a really interesting concept, something that could be very appealing to a small business. If you need someone to look over a contract, a lease, or whatever, you've got that legal advice on call because you're paying this small fee every month. Now, I'm also very much an advocate of using your, your local people, your local attorney and accountant, but for some of the smaller stuff, that was just an interesting concept. I thought that could meet the needs of a lot of small businesses. There are also a few online sites that you can go to for basic legal advice. Right. Um, but then when you get specific into your particular area, you're going to probably have to find somebody local and get some help. Just to add my five cents worth, I had a student a few years ago. He made his first million when he was 19. What have you guys been doing? Um, <laughs> what have I been doing? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he, um, his advice was he, by the time he sold his business at the time to Yahoo, it was one of those internet startups, um, got the million dollars off the top, the first half of that went straight to everybody that had helped him to get that business started. So his advice was relationships. When he needed legal advice to incorporate his business, one of his college buddy's dad was an attorney. He got him to help him for the promise of, I don't know what it was, 2% if he ever sold the business. And that attorney was willing to take that, to take that risk, and, and I thought that was a very creative way to not upfront pay any of these fees, to not incur that cost initially, but of course eventually they would be, there would be a, you know, a payment coming, and, uh, and the attorney was willing to take that. Um, so for what's that's worth. Um, I'd like to comment on something we uh, mentioned, sure. talked about earlier. 
um, when we're talking, starting this forum out, and we're talking in terms of going to a bank, trying to find financing and so forth, uh, there are other places that you can go, and Jeff brought it up when he was talking about networking, and uh, Dr. Grunhagen just did the same type of thing. Uh, I started a business in the early 90s, uh, called Repetitive Motion Trauma Corporation. Uh, my degree is in biomechanics and exercise physiology, and I thought I'd figured out an idea um, that would fix people that had carpal tunnel syndrome. And I was going to need probably fifty dollars to $100,000 to get the thing off the ground, get the product, get it all put together, and so forth and so on. I did not want to put any money into the idea. I had lost quite a bit of money in the previous years in investing in other things that just didn't work out. I have not made a dime investing. And I, I just was burned on that. So um, I didn't go to a bank, but what I did was I started to network with some of my friends and some of my other business friends. I said, who do you know that has maybe twenty, fifty thousand dollars they'd like to get involved in a good idea? I'd like to share it with them. And that's exactly what happened. I had uh, two guys uh, through that I met through friends of mine that put up the money. They didn't put a, a, uh, one minute into the concept itself. Uh, I put all the time into it, the sweat equity, if you will, and then they put the dollars into it. It turned out into a growing, booming business that went worldwide, and I sold it seven years later. So I didn't even touch a bank. So there are other ways uh, of doing that. Uh, how many of you have heard of crowdfunding? Just one? Crowdfunding, I hadn't heard of it either until just about a year ago. This is a brand new concept in funding a new business. Um, I, rather than try and talk a lot about it here, I recommend that you just Google crowd, C-R-O-W-D, funding. And basically what it is, it's just the opposite of the uh, situation I just described to you. I found two guys to put money into my business and they put tens of thousands of dollars each, obviously for a percentage of the business. Crowdfunding, you'll, you, you put your idea out there on the internet. Okay, there's a way to do this with crowdfunding sites and it depends on what type of business you have as to what crowdfunding site you want to use. Um, and then people that are interested in your business idea will invest $4. $400, $40, bucks, all for a very equitable and small share of any potential profit. What if you're the, the next Facebook? Was it worth putting in $40 to see if maybe that would take off? And that's how crowdfunding mm -hmm. works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a question here, a uh, follow-up question for what you said earlier, Ted. Um, and this is a question, an interesting question, um, that deals with the um, 79 people that didn't get the, get the job that you, that you interviewed and only <laughs> the, the two people were qualified. And the, the question is, um, do you think it's fair that somebody who doesn't have a clean background, maybe not in your situation because you obviously had good reason, but that, that for them it is very difficult to get, to find a job? I think everybody deserves a second chance, sometimes three. I've got no problem with that. I just cannot jeopardize, in my situation, my client's safety or the safety of their stuff by bringing somebody who has a criminal record who, was, who spent five years in jail for stealing other people's stuff. That just wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. Okay. Um, again, let's, let's switch gears here. We have a question. At what point, if ever, does a startup business need a board? And are there different types of boards for different purposes? One. I've never I've never been involved with a board. I've never needed a board. Um, I have no great answer. Now that's sometimes where you'll get involved with nonprofits or not for profits. For Generally example. speaking, mm -hmm. you'll need a board uh, for legal purposes and also just because it keeps everything um, ship ship shape. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, if you, I think if you go into a shareholders situation, you're going to have a board, or you may just have what is called an advisory board, which right. you just bring them in and get ideas from them and you can implement them or not you're not bound you're not beholden to them but it could be a place to gather ideas and sometimes those people on the board are maybe a mover shaker well-known person in the community and it simply gives your business credibility by having them be a part of it be a face for your business okay we have a question here another interesting one not sure whether you guys want to touch that question how do you think the current election will and or the, the, the election we just had will and has already affected entrepreneurship, 
whether it's at the rural level, at the, at the local level, or nationally? Well, I do have some strong views, and I won't say which way, <laughs> but um, I think you just have to do it. I mean, regardless, you, you can't wait for the right time, the wrong time, the funding, the this, the that. You have to make it happen for yourself. No matter how great or how poor the economy is, there are people being successful and growing businesses. You need to be one of them. You cannot wait. You just have to go and do it, and you can't say, I'm going to do it four years from now. I should have done it four years ago, whatever. You just got to do it. I would say the evolution of the economy in our country today is almost bigger than any individual that's in office. We're in a paradigm shift. We're moving away from the manufacturing-based uh, economy. The days of being in rural America and waiting for that next big factory to come to town is gone. Those jobs are not coming to rural America. Uh, in fact, we're losing some of our uh, factories in this area. So, so where, do, where does our economy go next? Well, there's increased understanding and focus on the need to support entrepreneurship as that economic driver in our smaller rural communities. And that's a lot of what we're talking about today. And then, and there's a shift from like econ economic development entities from recruiting new businesses to town to, and a shift to growing your own, growing entrepreneurs. Uh, statistics show that if you can grow your own, they're more vested in your communities. They put down deeper and longer roots and then they give back to the communities as opposed to recruiting someone in who may or may not stay in the community. So some of this is bigger than, like I said, who, whoever got, just got elected. Although it's no secret that some administrations are friendlier towards business than others. That's simply a fact. Um, and people that are thinking about going into business know that and will sometimes base their decision on their knowledge of what to expect in the, in the coming year. If you don't know what taxes are going to happen to you in the coming year, you're going to watch where you spend your money. You're going to watch where you hire. If you have to spend uh, thousands of dollars per employee suddenly because now you've got 51 employees <coughs> instead of 49, all kinds of things come into play. And the business owner, whether he's political or apolitical, has to deal with those things every single day. And I think you all understand at this point in time, the state of Illinois is not the most uh, business friendly state in the union. <laughs> um, and that's why through the Chamber of Commerce, we really advocate to our members and for our members to stand up for their for business issues. Traditionally, there are many other strong coalitions in, uh, that go to lobby at the state government, but typically the small business owner has been almost a non-entity. They're busy out there working in their businesses, but they don't have a voice in Springfield or Washington, and they're getting chewed up because of that. They're getting rolled over. The, uh, one of the ways the you know, state of Illinois tried to balance their budget was just by raising business fees, and that hit every single business owner out there. So we are, through the Chambers of Commerce, we are really trying to educate our members and business owners that you've got to be an advocate too. You've got to have a voice. You've got to interact with your legislatures and let them know when there's something moving through uh, the legislature that is detrimental to business, you've got to let them know why it is detrimental and how it hurts in the long run, hurts the economy for everyone. Okay. Um, we have a question here that seems to beg for war stories. What were some of the struggles that you encountered when starting up your business? So this may be a question for Jeff in particular, but it may also be for, for everybody else from your experience. Well, I'll give you an example. I mean, when I uh, bought my pro forma franchise, they take you to Ohio for five days of training. You're going out, you're having fun, wine and dine you. Okay, you get home Monday, Monday morning, you're in your basement. <laughs> what do I do now? What's next? I mean, yeah, I had all that training for five days, but that was, you know, now you have to just go out and do it. You have to motivate yourself. Um, it's difficult as a startup because when you work for somebody else, they're telling you what to do. Don't use your cell phone during working hours. Don't do this. Don't, you know, whatever it may be. When you're in charge, you can work as hard as you want. And the harder you worked, and not, it's not always the harder you work. Many times it's the smarter you work, the more successful you will be. 
I'm not trying to work more hours than anyone else. I'm trying to do a better job of what I'm actually accomplishing in those hours so I can grow my business, you know, and, and enjoy my life. My biggest challenge was time. Uh, as a swimming coach, my first workouts for my team started at 6 o'clock in the morning. I lived in a one-bedroom, second-floor apartment right next to Stevenson High School where I was coaching. Um, the workout ended at about 8, 8.30, something like that. Then we, uh, I taught uh, aquatics uh, from 8 to 4. Then I had another workout with my team from 4 to 6, 6.30, something like that. Then I went home and grab something to eat, and then I spent five hours working my business. Midnight, go back to bed, start all over again, six o'clock in the morning. Uh, just like Jeff said, I decided I was willing to work more hours for myself so I wouldn't have to work for somebody else all of my life. My dad was a life insurance agent, and he had this thing where he would, uh, tell clients that, you know, you basically start working uh, at a job for somebody else, maybe around age 20. You work till approximately age 65, 45 years, okay? And what have you got to show for at the end of the 45 years? A pension, which is probably worth about one third of what you couldn't figure out how to live on in the first place. <laughs> and so I decided I wanted to control my own situation. And if I failed, then I had to look in the mirror, but I wasn't gonna just keep on working from six in the morning until nine at night or whatever, day after day after day. It just wasn't going to, I, I couldn't picture a future like that or working for somebody else doing the same thing. Okay. We have another question back to Ted. So this, your interviewing process seems to <laughs> keep coming back. We didn't like that, huh? <laughs> no, this is actually... Which, how many of you were part of that 81? <laughs> Did I meet you for coffee? Anyway, go ahead. Um, the question here, um, longer question, if it was so difficult to find qualified applicants for a landscaping position, how do you go about finding applic applicants with a higher level uh, skills in your local area when there may only be so few qualified persons in the area? It's, it's a good question. Um, there are plenty of, you know, seats that can be filled up with people, but to find that quality individual is an ongoing process. Um, the guy that I've got for my crew supervisor, he's been with me now for six, seven years. Um, I mean, I can't even imagine trying to replace him. Now, when I need a new crew member, I work with him and see who he would like to work with. He's got more connections out in the community than I do, who would also know who is uh, looking for a job, who has the skill sets that I'm looking for, is a guy trainable, et cetera, et cetera. So I have my team help me do that. Mm -hmm. And when I'm hiring, I'm typically hiring for a sales position, and uh, I'm looking for personality and connections. I can teach you the rest. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have a question here about how to find partners. How do you, how do you go about, if you start a business, you know you need a partner, but you don't know where to look for them. I've thought about getting a partner about twice in these 14 years, both times, you know, when something went bad, a little downturn in the business. Um, I woke up again the next day and said, no, I don't want to do for this. I mean, I don't think you want a partner. I think partners, like you had said, just kind of create problems. You want to do it yourself. You can hire someone to help you. You can do whatever you want, but I think you want to be in charge of your business, especially at a very small you know, one, two, three, four person type of uh, sized business. And sometimes you just can't do that. Um, I, I started my landscaping business by default. Uh, another guy in town who was a teacher wanted to do something with his uh, summers. And he knew I was retired and he'd seen some of the stuff I'd done with my own yard and he wanted to know if I want to start a landscaping business with him. And I said, sure, let's give it a shot. Uh, he lasted two years and I had to decide if I wanted to continue going, and which I decided to do. Um, I had another business uh, where I had a business partner. We were 50-50 business partners. And it, it worked out in many, many ways. Uh, but then the inevitable situation started to come up, especially when we started to make uh, sales, uh, million dollar, million, two million dollar each sales. Suddenly our eyes got big. and We started wondering, okay, do I really need a partner? 
and he was thinking the same thing. So you run into those types of situations, and if you can get away with it, just do it yourself. I needed, I needed money to start uh, that uh, carpal tunnel syndrome uh, business. So it just depends on what your individual needs are. I'm not saying you shouldn't ever have a partner, uh, but go into it with your eyes wide open. Uh, make sure that I don't care if they're your best friend, have everything on paper. Don't make it just on a handshake. You'll, you'll do yourself a favor if you follow that direction. I have a question here. What is your top three list of where to go for advice or assistance? I think we've covered a lot of them here this evening. Uh, definitely we would uh, personally recommend the SCORE chapter. Uh, or finding your own mentor out, out there. We're very blessed in this area to have a four-year college, a two-year college with Lakeland. Lots of resources there that a lot of communities just don't have. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of resources out there. You just have to be proactive and kind of dig through them. There are trade associations. Uh, I would definitely recommend a Chamber of Commerce. It's a way to network, to meet other people who are doing the same thing you're doing. They've got a business. They're trying to keep that business going. If nothing else, someone else to commiserate with. But um, there are a lot of resources out there. I'm a big believer in SCORE as well. But the other thing I do is I talk to a couple friends of mine that I work with in a past job. They're very successful sales marketing guys that moved on to do something else. We'll just go out to lunch or go to a ball game or whatever it is, and I'll just throw things at them. And even though they haven't been in this industry in the last 10 years, they were in it for 10 or 15 years themselves, so they have some very, very good ideas um, that I might not have think of or I might have forgotten from 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there a source of assistance that you believe is largely overlooked? Is there a hidden gem somewhere that most people never think of? I've owned several businesses in the 40, last 40 years. I hadn't even heard of SCORE until five years ago when a business instructor here at Lumpkin, who was a part of SCORE, asked me to be a part of it. His name is Dave Arsenault. Uh, I, can't, I couldn't believe that there was this uh, tool available, this resource, that I, I'd never even heard of. So um, it and I, I realize I sound like I'm trying to, you know, toot the score horn here, but we've got nothing to gain. We're simply here to try and help. Um, when we've got 13,000 people from all those different types of businesses, and, I, and you come up to me and say, I want to do an ice cream business, I can go into the computer and I can pull out a bunch of people who have done just that. We can mentor with them. We can put you together. That's a resource. I don't know anything about the ice cream business, but I can find out for you. And sometimes, once you're up, up and operating, um, your employees, they get overlooked a lot of times, but your employees have a lot of very good ideas if you just ask them. Uh, they really do. Mm -hmm. And I would be remiss if I didn't toot the horn for Chambers of Commerce. Uh, just uh, talking to an individual this morning who, um, through really no fault of his own, lost his job last February and has been looking for that right fit for him and has finally now landed a, a good job It's a sales position and he's very excited about it but he ultimately that connection was made because all that time he was um, not employed he stayed involved with the chamber of commerce he came to our networking events he's actually on the board of directors he made kept making those connections he told everybody he knew that he was looking for a job and what kind of job he was looking for and this company ultimately connected him it contacted him directly because they had heard of him kind of through his involvement with the chamber and kind of the backstory to ted getting involved with score is it was uh, our local chamber of commerce helped start the local score chapter in 2005 and it was ted and i had a phone conversation because he was a member of the chamber of commerce and he was kind of telling me his background and I called up Dave Arsenault, who was our recruitment person for the SCORE chapter at the time, and said, you need to talk to this guy about getting him involved in SCORE. So it's, it's very interesting. You never know who you're out there talking to and who that may be the next contact. And I think one of my biggest pieces of advice is never burn a bridge. Even when you leave a business, even if you are totally PO'd at that a boss, don't burn that bridge. You never know what's going to come back around 
and who that person may know and mm -hmm. you just just never do that um, going off of that I know since most people here are students um, I think it's important to maintain the relationships with your professors as well because mm -hmm. you think of networking and you think of people that you're working with but your professors are those same people and they have experience other places outside of the college and you don't realize that you know when you're just starting college and you're late for class and you don't look good to your professors and then you realize as you become a senior and a junior that you need to maintain those connections because those are the people that can help get you a job and can help introduce you to some of those other people mm -hmm. that can take you places so it's important to maintain those relationships as well thank you Courtney um, we have a question here, another interesting one. Um, have you ever considered traveling to um, make your, to find ideas about how to grow your business? So travel overseas where, you know, you may encounter something that you had never thought about before. Is that, is that a way how you have, and, and a, you know, maybe Ted, maybe Jeff in particular here, how you have expanded your horizon? I have never traveled, per se, just to grow my business, but I will tell you, every time I travel, my eyes are open. I'm looking for ideas, I'm looking for leads, I'm looking for anything I can find that might help me grow. I mean, I, I can't remember the name of it, I used to always go to the University of Illinois, my oldest daughter went there, and there was a little uh, yogurt place by Green, by Green Street, and all the different kinds of yogurts that came out, and I'm like, I need to build one of those in Peoria. Well, I talked about it and talked about it, and last year, two other people did the same thing, two different locations. But just, just seeing what's there, and where you're, when you're visiting your friends, when you're doing anything, what's a really neat thing? You know, what, what does Charleston maybe not have a certain kind of business you might have back home that you could bring to Charleston or vice versa? Keeping your eyes open to things that you like, food you like, services you like, whatever it may be, find that niche, find that something you need to fill, mm -hmm. and that's a great way to start a business. I think travel is an important aspect of education in general, period. Uh, I've been fortunate uh, primarily because of business to travel most places, uh, well, in the northern hemisphere, most places in the world. Uh, my first business I expanded into Canada, Mexico, England, Germany, France, Korea, Japan, and a couple other places I don't remember now. But the point is I got to go to those places, tax deductible, and um, learning about the people in those different areas, the things that were the same and the things that were different and how that would affect my business um, were very dramatic. Uh, Dr. Grunhagen was talking uh, before we started this thing off about Cindy's recent trip to China uh, a few weeks back and talking about the cultural differences and how that uh, translates into different business uh, mores as well. Uh, you have to know a little bit about how that other person is thinking and what they expect from you as a business to do business with, uh, otherwise you'll find yourself maybe caught a little short. If you don't know that that Korean businessman is going to automatically cut down your profit um, margin at the very, very end of this meeting and that he hasn't told you about that yet, if you don't know that because that is what he has been trained to do, okay, by his culture, then, you know, you're at a disadvantage. Um, also, just it, it, a perfect example, when I was uh, traveling in Korea, the landscaping was totally different. I hadn't even owned a landscaping business yet. But what I learned about the differences in how they grow trees and into things and how they structure that uh, was fascinating to me. And now I incorporate that into some of my landscaping plans, uh, which is totally unique for this area. So there you go. And in the promotional product industry that we're in, probably 80% of the products are actually made in China and other places overseas. Now, we will sometimes buy direct from overseas, but many of our suppliers that make the pint glasses, that make the Frisbees, that make whatever you can imagine, they're getting most of that from overseas. And then they're just imprinting, you know, the blue logo on it or whatever it may be. So a lot of what we have is done overseas. So having the knowledge of what's going on, you know, if cotton prices are going up, expecting the cost of T-shirts or whatever it may be, knowing some of those things is very important to our business and our growth. Several years ago through the Chamber of Commerce, we implemented a program called Sister City Business Assistance Program. And the concept was, is we, 
we selected a, another community in the state of Illinois, kind of similar to Charleston, and that was Macomb, Illinois, where Western Illinois University is located. And the idea was that we would pair up similar kind of business owners, that they could share ideas and get ideas from each other, but they didn't have any overlap with their market area, so they could be more open about saying, how do you do this, how do you do that? And they wouldn't feel threatened for example, you would not match up someone from Charleston and someone from Mattoon because they're, they're compet competing in the same market area. But you get them across the state and you might get that. For example, a uh, bicycle sh shop in Charleston, we could have paired them up with someone in Macomb and they could have shared common interests. Um, I won't say very many people took advantage of this, but again, that was a way of traveling at least a little ways away mm -hmm. and talking to someone who has a similar kind of business. Now, since we're talking about small town America, just share one uh, anecdote here. One of the things that I uh, have observed is that things that become a trend elsewhere, oftentimes overseas, eventually they make it to the U.S. and then eventually, at some point, they trickle down even to to more rural communities. Um, first time I was in China in 2006, uh, so it's been six years ago. One one of the things that I became fascinated was with was is something that you guys are all familiar now here with, and it's growing here, is, is the, the bubble tea. You guys familiar with bubble tea? Some of you guys have heard about bubble tea? These, these. Or tea. And milk. And it's, it's something that is coming to the States. It's in Europe, <laughs> relatively big now, and since I, study franchising, I was fascinated by these little shops that they had, that there was not much equipment needed. This was you know, a fairly small operation, and they had high-tech machines that would seal the cups so there was no spillage. Right? They don't have the plastic, the flimsy plastic lids that you guys are all familiar uh, with at fast food restaurants where you, know, you, you, you toss it over and it, it will spill. They have, they have little machines that will put a seal on top of the cup and fascinated with that. I've seen it now here even in Charleston. So this is the kind of stuff that eventually comes here and so travel does in, in fact actually educate you. Um, as we're winding down here, um, I have maybe one more question here to, to um, you know, at the end here. Um, again, a question for uh, some of you that have actually operated your own business. Um, what has been your marketing strategy? And has there been a difference between the time that you started and the time that you were further advanced in your business? So I know Jeff, for example, is all about sales and marketing. So when I started out, you know, 15 years ago with my own company, I, mean, I was I was on the phone. I was doing face to face. I mean, I was doing a lot of that when it comes to marketing. Now the most successful thing we do is we just annoy you with email blasts, and you wouldn't imagine how many orders I get from these email blasts. 85% of the people delete them, but every time I have a database of roughly two to 3,000 people, I probably get five orders every Wednesday when I send something out, and it's just absolutely amazing. Then you just service the orders. So I know people don't like getting these emails, but boy, are they effective. How did you get your email addresses? I go to many, many different trade shows, and every place I go, I pick up every business card I can. I have an intern that puts it together. We have a little six-point opt-out thing if they really want off the list, <laughs> and uh, we just fire them off there. And it's very niche-oriented. We have some different niches we do. So we have like a sports uh, list. We do a lot of catalog printing. We have a catalog list, and so we just do special offers to those individual things that, that really uh, would benefit them. In fact, we did so many emails. We had a new intern last week, and uh, we sent out an email blast that just had the, the subject line, and she forgot to put the main part. <laughs> so half an hour later, we sent out another one, and we got in trouble for spamming. We got shut down. So we had to redo our next, our first email again today, finally. But that's the only time it's ever happened. But that has been a very successful way for us to market. Very creative. It depends on what kind of a business you have, what kind of product or service you have as to what your market's going to be. And what your market's going to be determines how you're going to market your product or service. Um, with the carpal tunnel thing, okay, uh, I had to do some research as to who had carpal tunnel. Uh, both of my grandfathers did. One was a barber, one was a dentist, and they were working with their hands all the time, so they developed carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, carp just so you understand, uh, carpal tunnel developed through an overused situation like that is because is, is developed because you're over 
strengthening the muscles on one part of your body and not balancing on the other. If you were to do bicep exercises like a curl all day, every day, all day, every day, and did nothing with your triceps, you're going to have some problems, okay? Um, found out that chiropractors, the number two thing they work on after back uh, is wrist, is carpal tunnel. Um, found out that there was a whole industry in uh, the meat packing uh, business uh, that had severe problems. I found out all, and there's no point in going through them all, but I had to find out where my markets were and then what I would do is I would write free articles on the concepts for this particular product for their trade magazines. Um, truck drivers get it, okay, from holding onto the steering wheel all day long. Okay, so I would write one for the trucking industry. It would be different than the one I wrote for the American Dental Association. It was different than the one that was published in OSHA magazine. So it just depends. Um, when I had uh, a sign business, I, uh, you've all been to amusement parks and you see these uh, large 70 foot tall uh, signs on the interstate right beside the, the park and it's showing you videos and so forth of the rides and so forth. That's, I had a business uh, back in the 80s and early 90s uh, that sold those. Well, where am I going to go? I went to places like amusement parks. Uh, Six Flags became my best customer. Everybody wanted to go to Six Flags, but I had to develop a different marketing strategy. Those signs cost about a million dollars each, my cost, okay? Um, they're a high-tech toy. And so what I would do is I would contact the president of each park and I would say, I've got a million dollar high-tech electronic sign to advertise your park and I'd like to give it to you for free. <laughs> would you like to get together and discuss this? I got an appointment every single time. <laughs> and what I would do is I would give them a million dollar sign for free. And then the, in the contract, I own half of the time on that sign. So every 30 seconds of every minute, I own that. And I sold that time to Miller Brewing, to Delta Airlines, United Airlines, Coca-Cola, so forth, for one and a half million. You can do the math. It depends on the business and the type of market that you have as to how you're going to market yourself and your product. And the reason I'm doing email or email wouldn't be effective in a big ticket item like that is when I'm selling these catalogs, I'm selling those to our suppliers, to the guys that make the Frisbees and make the mugs, and they know us. So I've stopped at trade shows, talked to them, got their cards. I'm just wanting to remind them at the, at the proper time they need to order a catalog, I'm their guy. And I used to do that, and I would actually go out and I would try and price your catalog, and it's $20,000. They would take my price to the local guy who'd come in less. So I put together a marketing plan where if you print your catalog with me, I'll help you sell more of your Frisbees or whatever to all the different pro forma offices across the country. So I turn the whole thing to make them come back to me because they're going to generate additional revenue if I print their catalog. Okay, last question for tonight. Entrepreneurs are so busy and crunched for time. How important is it for you to occasionally take a step back and take a broader look at the business? Maybe take some time off, take a time out. I'd say it's essential. We all need that to get you know bogged down on the day to day. You've got to step back and let that other side, that right side of your brain, kick in and you know, get those creative juices going. Look at it with un under a different lens. I think that's the only way you can really keep growing. I think it's critical, otherwise you become too myopic. You're, you're focused so much on what you're doing today, which is the same thing you did yesterday, which is the same thing you're gonna do tomorrow, and you lose the bigger picture. So you do need to step back once in a while. You do need to uh, refresh. And that my, my landscaping business, for example, the last day was last Friday. I'm not starting again till April 1st. I need that time. Then that's when I spend more of my time with SCORE, too, of course. But uh, I need that getaway time. Otherwise, I would burn out. And I'm, I'm a very laid-back personality. When I go to different trade shows, we're going to Las Vegas or Orlando. I'll normally get there two days early or stay two days late. Um, I really try and mix business with pleasure. So I, I think I do pretty well when it, when it comes to stepping back and being able to do that just from my personality because... Um, like I say, I want to work smarter. I, want, I don't want to work harder, per se. And what I get from making money in my own business is I'm building time to do whatever I want. If it's go to my kid's soccer game, if it's to do whatever it wants, if it's to go on vacation, I'm building time. And I think it can be, become very troublesome 
if you end up working 90 hours a week and never get away and just work your whole life, what have you really accomplished? The objects that have fun and have the money to be able to have fun. And you mentioned Entrepreneur Magazine. There was uh, an article a couple of months ago, actually, that talked about, uh, you guys have all heard about businesses that are seasonal, right? The ice cream vendor or the hot dog vendor. And how oftentimes we hear that businesses are trying to get away from the seasonality to, you know, smoothen out the bumps that they're going through for the year. Well, there was a suggestion, it's a suggestion in the article that um, there's probably an increase, and there's not probably, there's definitely an increasing number of people that are actually looking at those seasonal businesses because for those exact reasons, they can actually take a part of the year off, take a step back, and so they only have to commit to a certain season of the year. So with that, first of all, thank you to the panelists here for, for an incredible job tonight. Thank you for making the long trip from Peoria over here, too. contributed with many questions. Thank you for your interest. Um, pass the word that we are um, starting this new workshop in the summer. And um, have a good uh, trip home. And thank you for coming. <laughs>